Hey everybody, today we're gonna to talk about the Army's NGSWFC, which stands for the Next Generation Squad Weapon Fire Control. Now before we get into this video, just know that unlike a lot of our other product videos where I can go into very detailed specifications about the product itself, in this particular case, we're not gonna be able to get as specific as some of you may wish we could. We're gonna do our best to give you a very general overview of this optic and hopefully an idea of what some of its capabilities are. And just know also that there is a podcast where we go into some of these capabilities in a longer format. Now, just what is this next generation squad weapon and then the fire control that we're gonna talk about here? Well, this is a project that the Army has been undergoing for quite some time now to replace what we all know now as the M4 as well as the M249 with one all new generation of firearm to put into our warfighters' hands. So that's the NGSW part of it, but the FC is the fire control. Naturally, when they're going to a new platform, that's a very big deal for the military. They wanted to also upgrade the optic going on top, and that's what we have here. Vortex, along with many other companies, submitted their proposal for what would be this NGSW FC, and ultimately were awarded the contract. So what you see before you here, and now what's known as the XM157, is what will ultimately be fielded by a number of our military personnel in the coming years. So now the fun stuff, what is it and what does it do? At least as much as we can get into at this point. Well, at the very base, let's talk about that first. This is a traditional low power variable optic. That means that the optic starts out on its lowest magnification at one power, and then it goes up to a higher power for longer range engagements. In this particular case, this scope is a one to eight by 30. We start on that one power, we can go all the way up to eight power or anywhere in between, and we have a 30 millimeter objective. Now, for those who may be wondering, obviously Vortex Optics has a number of low power variables in its lineup already. None of those optical systems are actually shared with what we see before us now. This was a completely from the ground up, all new optical design, the one to eight by 30 in here. Very, very high end optic. And just that in and of itself is a huge improvement for our warfighters in terms of what they have atop their firearms. Now all you have to do is take a quick glance at this optic and you can tell there's a lot more going on here than just it being a traditional low power variable optic. Now part of the Army's requirements with this contract is that they wanted this scope to be what a lot of people are simply referring to as a smart scope. So not only did they wanna have a passive optic that you can use without aid of electronics, just like any other rifle scope, in this case with a glass etched reticle in the first focal plane with normal elevation and windage turrets, all that good stuff, they then also wanted to be able to put a display with information over top of that image in the first focal plane to give our soldiers a whole lot more useful information than just a regular glass etch reticle can provide. The way that display works then has to be like augmented reality. We wanna be able to change it on the fly, customize it, put in the display what we want. We don't wanna to have to rely on very specifically placed LEDs within the screen that limit us to where we can put information or rely on fiber optics or anything else like that. They wanted a completely digital solution that didn't mess with the regular passive optics function, but then that could, again, give all that information. Now, what type of information might need to be put into the field of view? Well, a lot of that is related to our onboard sensors and measurement devices. Just within this scope, we have an onboard ballistic solver, an onboard laser range finder. We have digital compass and also environmental sensors, as well as intra-soldier wireless or ISW. Some of the other really neat capabilities that this optic as a whole package has would include the IR and visible aiming lasers that are part of this range finding unit on top. One of the really neat things about this whole unit is that all three lasers for the rangefinder and then the two aiming lasers are all slaved together, which makes zeroing it a snap. Now with something this technologically advanced and with seemingly a lot going on, how can it possibly be durable enough to be fielded by our military? Well, certainly when the military is looking to have something that's gonna go on top of the rifles, they wanna make sure that it is durable. So this optic and everything around it, attached to it, part of it, had to go through military standard extreme environmental testing, including rigorous drop tests, extreme hot and cold tests, immersion testing, and also tens of thousands of rounds on the Mark 17 with live fire. So we get that this product is technologically advanced and it's gone through a great deal of testing to ensure durability. 
but is it easy to use? Ease of use was at the forefront of our development team's innovation throughout this entire process for the scope and everything around it. We knew it had to be quick to learn and easy and intuitive to pick up and use in the field. So like we said, at the base, again, this is a traditional low power variable optic, just like lots of people are already very much used to. For zeroing, it has the elevation and windage turrets in the exact same place you'd normally find them on any other rifle scope. So that's an easy process that many people are familiar with. And like we said, it's a quick process to get this laser range finding and also aiming laser set up on top, zeroed in. And it's much easier to do than anything else as far as weapons mounted laser range finding modules on the market today. Displaying a ballistics correction in the field of view of this optic is as simple as the end user pressing one button. All they have to do is center the target in the reticle of the scope, press that one button, whether it be on a remote device or on the side keypad on the optic itself here, and then the optic will do all the rest. At that point, it's going to shoot a laser, get the reception, come up with a ballistics correction for both elevation, windage, and if applicable, also can't. It will then display that via an active reticle display with a dot inside the field of view for where the user needs to hold over. And this whole process is extremely transparent to the end user and happens in just tenths of a second. In terms of what weapon platform this optic can be used with, really any rifle with a Picatinny rail on top is gonna to be good to go. Obviously, this whole program was designed around the NGSW, that firearm itself, but there's still going to be many other firearms in the field, in use, even when that rifle starts to come out. So we wanted to make sure that this optic could go on top of anything. In our testing, we've used it on top of M4s, M249s, squad designated marksman rifles, Mark 17s, and it all worked just fine with this optic. Now in terms of weight, that's a spec that we can't get into the exact details about. But what we can tell you is that when you compare this setup, as you see here on the table, to a traditional low power variable mounted in a one piece cantilever mount with a weapons mounted laser range finder, that setup there that we just mentioned would actually come out to be more than this setup that you see here on the table. Not to mention that our optic here has the first focal plane display inside, displaying information to the end user. It has environmental sensors on board, expandable interfaces, which we'll get into, and also aiming lasers integrated in with the rangefinder. Now the first expandable interface is actually being used currently as the scope sits here on the table. As you see it here is how it would essentially come out of the box, so to speak, with this laser rangefinder mounted on top. But that is a separate piece. The optic with all of the brains inside, the display, the environmental sensors, all that good stuff is separate from this laser rangefinder and aiming laser module on top. So it could be removed and in theory down the road, it could be swapped out for something different. Also, we have another expandable interface here towards the objective end of the scope for an additional accessory should that come down the line. And then a third on the front here for attaching a remote device of some sort for controlling the optic and all of its accessories. Certainly some of you may be wondering, where's this product made? Well, as far as the development, we'll start there. From the ground up, this whole product has been a development that has happened in-house only in-house here in Barneveld, Wisconsin at our headquarters by our development team for this project. In terms of where all the components that go into the scope come from, the vast majority of all the components, including very uniquely, even the lenses come from the USA with only a couple of parts inside of this whole assembly coming from some of our European allies. And then last but not least, as far as the assembly goes, all of these optics will be completely assembled here again at our headquarters in Barneveld, Wisconsin. Now for the biggest question that many of you are probably wondering, can you get one? The short answer is not right now. The long answer is, like we said, this is a 10 year contract with the army requesting hundreds of thousands of units. And this is a big deal for them being the next generation squad weapon and the fire control to go on top. We wanna to make sure that we're doing everything on our end to fulfill our part of the deal and manufacture these scopes to the Army's demand. Now, if things keep going along smoothly and we make it through this process the first couple of years perhaps smoothly and we have additional capacity to make more of these optics for the consumer market, for example, that's absolutely a possibility that we're willing to entertain and it's one that's certainly not off the table. Again, we just need to see once we get down the line a little bit further.
So there you have it, folks. There's at least some of the details around the XM-157 or the next generation squad weapon fire control. If you wanna hear from the project manager from our development team around this whole optic, again, like we said, hop on over to the Vortex Nation podcast, episode 220. We go into a little bit more of these details in longer format. If you have any questions about this optic, just know we may not be able to answer all of them, but feel free to put them in the comments below. Or of course, any of our other products, you can always hit us up in the comments via social media, on the phone, email, whatever works best for you. Thanks again, everybody, for watching these videos as usual. We'll see you on the next one.